Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to A Date with the Pollinators. Uh, my name is Jamie. I'm here with my, my coworker Alexa and we're with the Gorge Waterway Action Society Youth Community Partnership Program. And we're here today to tell you all about pollinators um, and especially the new pollinator meadow that we've got up in the Esquimalt Gorge Park. So the Esquimalt Gorge Park has had a vastly changing and diverse history through time. The park's part of the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. They, along with other First Nations groups, such as the Souk and Wasainich First Nations, have historical and current relationships with the land that continue to this day. Uh, we've provided a link in your info packet if you want to learn more about the Lekwungen speaking peoples, their history, culture, and the important work that they do today. Before we get too far, we also want to thank the Gorge Waterway Action Society and the Youth Community Partnership Program for giving us the opportunity to add upon the already robust outreach of the Nature House, as well as the Township of Esquimalt for their assistance and support. Um, if you don't know about the Gorge Waterway Action Society, they're a nonprofit group. Uh, they're one of the organizations included in the entirety of the Gorge Waterway Initiative. Um, but after decades of damage by industrial, urban, and recreational activities, the GWAS, which is the, the short form of Gorge Waterway Action Society, uh, was founded to restore and preserve the EGP, shortened version of the Esquimalt Gorge Park, um, as well as run a multitude of educational programs through the Nature House. One of the main projects of the GWAS has been the daylighting of the Gorge Creek project. So it used to be culverted. Um, and then in 2005, the project began to return the creek to a more natural watershed drainage point. Uh, both to improve the water quality and increase biodiversity in the area. Um, and since then, the GWAS has been diligently monitoring both this project, as well as coming up with new ones to improve the Esquimalt Gorge Park for everybody. I'm gonna head down, down to the meadow. Um, in the summer of 2020, you might've noticed this new addition to the park, just adjacent to the Gorge Creek. Um, there's a big long stretch of fenced off wood chip and that's our new pollinator meadow site. One of the goals for this uh, meadow is to bring in native pollinators uh, because we have non-native pollinators and they're useful, but they can't pollinate necessarily all of our native species. So each plant comes with its own attractants and requirements of its pollinators. Most pollinators and their plants have some level of co-evolution, meaning they evolved in a way that they altered their physiologies to better support one another. And so the pollinators, they get pollen, sometimes nectar, um, from the plants that they're heading out to. So pollen's super nutritionally dense for insects, but what are the plants getting out of the relationship? Um, so they get pollinated. Uh, when a bug crawls on a plant to drink its nectar and collect pollen and everything, they get these little grains of pollen all over themselves. And then they bring this pollen to the next plant that they visit. So once they get to the next plant that they're having a snack with, uh, the pollen gets brushed off. Um, some plants can self-pollinate, some can't. Um, and even if they can self-pollinate, it doesn't mean it's the necessarily the best evolutionary strategy. Populations can become vulnerable to collapse without, if they don't have that genetic diversity in the population um, to allow them to be adaptable to a changing environment, um, particularly important with the amount of climate change that we're seeing lately. Plants and uh, pollinators, they've got this relationship and plants have sacrificed in order to develop this close relationship. They have to invest a lot of energy into the production of both the flowers, the bright colors and all the pollen and nectar in order to attract the pollinators to them. This high probability of pollination from the insects is only highly probable if the population and the activity remains constant. A plant can signal a specific pollinator by changing the color of its blooms. Another way that plants can choose their pollinators by the shape of their blooms. So if you can see in this one, if a plant wants to attract a hawk moth with, with that big long tongue, they might develop a long tunnel through which the moth has to reach into in order to feed. So these different investments yield different results. Um, just like different investments yield different pollinators actually. And yeah, normally we, we think about flowers and we think about butterflies and we think about bees, but there's other type of pollinators as well. So 
Some plants actually smell like rotting meat and they produce heat in order to bring flies to them because their preferred pollinators are a fly. It's another reason why having the native plants is important because they're going to attract the specific native pollinators. And this is gonna help both the plant and the pollinator prolif proliferate. So yeah, the pollinators get a ton of nutrition from the plants that they visit. Um, but if this pollen is so nutritionally dense, as we've said, why do they need more than one source? So not all pollen has the same nutritional content. Uh, they all have the same basic components, but the relative composition of these components varies between the species, which is just another way that the plant pollinator relationship is specified. The quality of the pollen can also help protect pollinators against pathogens as well as parasites. You know, we like to plant these beautiful ornamental plants, but they don't often have the same quality or quantity of pollen as those of the native species. They're beautiful to look at and the pollinators are gonna come and check them out, but they're not necessarily providing them with the nutrition they need. So if only one type of pollen's available, even if it is a high quality pollen, the pollinators are susceptible to nutritional deficits if that pollinator is not adapted to live off the only one plant source. So some pollinators only pollinate a small number of very specific plants, whereas some pollinate a wide variety of plants. And it works the same for the plants themselves. So some plants are only attractive to a small number of pollinators and others to a super broad range. The native pollinators tend to be more specialists and they stick to a diet of usually just a couple of their native species. Um, one example of an extreme specialist relationship is the yucca plant. So yucca plants are only pollinated by the yucca moths here. This type of exclusive relationship is called an obligate mutualism. So the two organisms rely on each other exclusively for survival. So some of you might be familiar with this movie, the bee movie. Uh, but there are some problems with the movie. You need a variety of different pollen sources in, able, in order to create a really robust and diverse community. So in this movie, they're only using the one type of pollen to pollinate a wide variety of species, which in reality would not work. One thing the movie does do right is it shows the collapse um, of several plant species when pollinators stop working essentially. So um, just kind of a, a cool metaphor for you know, explaining some of these concepts on a simple scale. So in order to create a natural landscape of native plants, phase one of uh, the pollinator meadow project had two main goals. One is to remove the existing grass cover, including the roots. And two was to plant shrubs as a perimeter and clusters of native plants throughout the site. But before you wanna begin actively altering the site, you wanna collect a bunch of baseline data of the plant and insect diversity in the area to determine whether or not the implementation is going to have any effect on the diversity of the pollinators, as well as the um, invasive species in the area. They collected baseline data. You can see here, this was a bit of their methodology. They had some transects and off these transects, they had one meter squared quadrats that they would look at to determine how many pollinators, what type of pollinators, what type of plants, and how many plants were in this area. Once they had all this baseline data, the township of Esquimalt came in, mowed the area to remove the bulk of the grass and in the invasive species. And then they tilled the area a few times uh, below the grass root layer to disrupt the seed banks. And after that, the native species were planted as well as the shrub boundary planted along the back side of the fence line. They also added some natural textures. Uh, by creating that small depression in the site, water can accumulate and make a little bit of a muddy area for pollinators to come and hydrate. The shrubs chosen during phase one were ch chosen based on their aggressive growth and suitability to the site. They also wanted plants with aggressive growth patterns so that they had a chance to outcompete the invasives. Another long-term goal for the project was to have a meadow with a long bloom time, meaning that there's a broad spread of blooming times for the plants in the meadow so that the local pollinators are going to have forage for as long as possible through the year. Once you put a plant into motion, you have to usually adjust for the unexpected. So in the case of this meadow, 
they initially didn't want to lay down this chip in the surface because it makes the soil just a little bit acidic and a little bit harder for plants to grow. But the remaining seed banks of the grasses in the soil required it for the suppression of the regrowth. Um, and then this fence that wasn't that wasn't necessarily in the plan, but the deer in the park are always good at finding snacks. Phase two. Um, is hopefully going to expand the meadow to include a bit of the Gary Oak meadow that's just adjacent. We're also gonna have a better idea of how the invasive plants in the area are being managed and coming up with new ideas for the maintenance of invasive removals. Um, another project that's hopefully in the works um, is creating a leaf litter compost to test as a more natural and sustainable method of grass suppression, which will also allow for more nutrient cycling if placed around the edges of the growing plants. Monitoring is an important part of a, a project like this, and this is kind of the collection of insects from the first pollinator um, survey. So you can see we had a bunch of butterflies there. We've got a clear wing moth. Here we've got a bunch of uh, bees and wasps, and then we move down into some more flies. One of the biggest challenges for a site like this is maintaining the invasive removal. One consideration is you know that edge boundary was put in to help uh, limit the amount of seed spread back into the meadow. Um, but another is removing the seed heads of the invasive species around the site prior to spreading. spreading. So one invasive in particular is this Canadian thistle, uh, an invasive species despite its name. Um, and if uh, you can remove the seed heads of those before they seed, it's super important. The Gorge Creek restoration through the park was a huge undertaking, had a big effect on the park. One of the main goals of this project was to return it to a more natural landscape. But you know, with a project that large, there's unexpected side effects. One of which uh, that affects this pollinator meadow is the, the aggressive grasses that are in there. And in order to stabilize that soil, they applied a hydro seed blend, which is full of like aggressive and fast growing non-native grasses, which um, quickly rooted and stabilized the topsoil. And they did exactly what they were supposed to do. But now that we're trying to um, refine a bit of the natural systems in the park, they're no longer um, necessarily what we're looking for. Things can change through time, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. The invasives are always gonna be trying to make their way back into the site to choke out the native species. It's just an inevitability of working in an urban area. We've altered the landscape around us so much that we've created these spaces and these pockets so our native plants can't thrive the way they had without our influence. But as environmental stewards, it's our job to mitigate and reduce our impact on these sensitive ecosystems. And one big contributor to this project was the Greater Victoria Green Team. Um, the team came through and helped us clear up the meadow as well as helping plant some of the, the species in the park. So we're super thankful for all the volunteers, whether they come through the green team or elsewhere. Um, and yeah, things are a little bit different during this COVID-19 pandemic, but if you think you might have an interest in it, keep an eye on the green team meetup page. Having a garden, it's already just like a great first step in helping pollinators. Um, if you can add native plants and na natural textures like the boulders and, and old woody material to your garden. I found this really cool project. If you want to make your own mud hole for butterflies, uh, just a shallow dish with a bit of wet sand or mud and some rocks. The rocks make it so the little insects won't drown when they come for a drink. Um, and if you add a little bit of compost or manure to the mud puddle, it'll help the butterflies get some more nutrients. I was wondering if you know, maybe know any of these pollinators and um, flower species. So anybody know who this is? Hoverfly. Okay. So we got a hoverfly on Queen Anne's. What about this one? Entire leaf gum weed, you got it. What about this little guy? Leaf cutter bee. Yeah, those, so those are like its larvae. And the last one? Anybody know this? So I wanna thank everybody for coming out. Uh, if you wanna consider becoming a GWAS member, donations and memberships all go through the website at gorge.ca. You can follow us on Facebook at our Gorge Waterway Nature House and our new 
our new Instagram account, Gorge Waterway Nature House. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to follow up, send any emails, questions, ideas, photos, of your own pollinator meadows to uh, thegorgewaterway at gmail.com. Thank you so much for participating. Hey, everyone. Have a great night.